you for tuning in. Uh, we are so incredibly delighted to have with us Dr. Maniba Salim. Um, Dr. Salim is an associate professor in the Department of Communication and Media at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She is in sunny Southern California. Uh, she's a faculty associate at the Institute for Social. Oh, she used to be a faculty associate for the Institute for Social. No, I still am. Still you am. are. Okay, great. I, oh my goodness, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, uh, her work is so important. I think it's laid the groundwork on how we look at how media frames affect uh, people's uh, attitudes, how they affect Muslims themselves. Um, she's done a lot of work to explore how media violence has influenced aggression and reduced pro-social behaviors. Um, a lot of her work has looked at interpersonal and intergroup conflicts. And so I think we're just so incredibly uh, delighted to learn from you, Moniva. Um, I believe you have 15 minutes, if I'm correct. Mohammed. Okay, and um, there's no way for me to like be kind of like awkward and sort of hand gesture to you. So um, if you can keep track of time, if not, I'll just interrupt you really awkwardly, but. Yes, without. please do. Okay, all right, so without further ado. Okay, thank you so much, Nazida. I just wanna thank the organizers for um, inviting me to this panel. I always you know, appreciate talking to folks from different fields because you just learn so much. And so I'm here to talk about media's influence on American Muslim intergroup relations. And I am a social psychologist by training, although I am currently in the Department of Communication because a lot of my research looks at how media uh, representations influence intergroup relations. And I look at this both from the perspective of the majority group as well as the minority group. And so most recently I've been looking at this in the context of uh, American Muslim attitudes. And so it's no surprise that Muslims are the least like social group in the US. Um, they have been for the last two decades or so. A lot of the public opinion polls tell us that. Um, and that those attitudes are consequential because they lead to hostile behaviors, such as here we can see that anti-Muslim assaults have actually gone up. Um, they've surpassed the number in 2001, which a lot of people so-called expected because of the 9-11 attacks. And so you can see that this has a behavioral consequence. We really um, can't just say that these are attitudes. And I look at media as a source of information, as a factor for affecting these kinds of added, uh, outcomes because most Americans don't have direct contact with Muslims in their daily lives. And most, for most Americans, media are the primary source of information about Muslims. And what we know from theory is that media stereotypes are especially detrimental when you have limited contact with members of that group because you have no way to counter what you're seeing in the media from your own experiences. And so media really ends up having an overwhelming influence on your attitudes towards that group. Now, if we take a look at the kinds of ways in which Muslims and uh, groups, the MENA representation is on American media, it's actually really, really negative. Content analyses show that this group tends to be associated with violence, with aggression, and this is consistent in television, in movies, children's literature, video games, social media, take any genre and you'll find these patterns. And I study specifically the association of Muslims as aggressive targets because theory says that that is really problematic because it's not just developing a negative attitudes towards that group, it's developing aggressive attitudes towards that group. So what do I mean? I mean that when you see somebody who is part of this group, you automatically think something aggressive about them. Like if a child brought a strange object to school, you automatically think that it must be something aggressive, like a bomb. It automatically makes you feel angry emotions when you encounter members of this group and ultimately facilitates aggressive behaviors over even completely random things that have nothing to do with threat, your threat towards yourself. And so think about it in this way, the, you know, every, all of us have a concept of terrorism in our minds that's probably associated with these kinds of attributes. And the first time that you see a news story about Muslims committing some sort of a terrorist act, your brain creates this link between the concept of terrorism and this group. And the more times you see it gets closer and closer and closer until all of those concepts are automatically activated every single time you hear about Muslims or you think about Muslims. And so that's what has happened um, over time for us, for a lot of the Americans and a lot of the world, frankly. And media stories are creating these automatic associations within our mind. So I'm gonna talk about a few studies where we test these assumptions. Um, first of all, I'm gonna present a longitudinal study where we are interested in understanding if exposure to negative media images of Muslims 
increases perceptions of Muslims as aggressive, as well as anger towards Muslims. And that subsequently leads to aggressive behaviors such as support for public policies that are harming Muslims. And in this first study, we did this with um, college students who were non-Muslims, and it was done across three ways. And all the measures were assessed at all time points so we could assess changes over time. Just gonna give you an example of some of the measures that we looked at. So we wanted to see how much they rely on media as a source of information about Muslims, how much they rely on direct contact as a source of information about Muslims, the number of Muslims that they have um, and they consider as their friends. And then we also looked at demographic variables like sex, age, and political orientation. We were interested in looking at perceptions of Muslims as aggressive, as well as anger towards Muslims. And you can see some example items of how we assess those. And finally, we were interested in looking at support for aggressive policies for Muslims, but also support for aggressive actions in Muslim countries. And so these are some of the sample items that you can take a look at. Note here, we're actually asking about civil restrictions for Muslim Americans. So Muslims living in the US should not be allowed to vote. And um, it turns out that really doesn't matter. Um, either way, people still support hostility towards this group. And so you can see here, our results showed that reliance on media for information about Muslims at time one was positively associated with anger at Muslims at time two, as well as perceptions of Muslims as aggressive at time two. And both of those mediators were associated with our policy outcomes. So support for military action in Muslim countries, as well as support for similar restrictions for Muslim Americans. And you can see that reliance on direct contact has a negative effect on anger at Muslims, although this effect was not significant for perceptions of Muslims. Aggressive. And so here we're actually looking at changes from one time point to another, showing that these negative media perceptions are influencing increases or decreases in the ways that you think about Muslims as well as what you feel towards Muslims. We followed this up with a um, couple of experimental studies in which we randomly assigned participants to either be exposed to a neg negative uh, news clip about Muslims, a neutral news clip which had neither positive or negative valence, and then a positive clip in which they were shown um, doing some charity work for their communities. And the results replicated what I just showed. Basically, everybody who watched the negative news clip was more likely to think of perception of Muslims as aggressive, they were more likely to support civil restrictions for Muslims, and they were more likely to support military action in Muslim countries compared to the folks in the other two conditions. I want to just quickly note that this green bar, I think, is really useful because it's showing that you don't really need to have positive representation to reduce these negative attitudes. All you need is something that's not negative. So just a non-negative representation of Muslims is enough to bring down the baseline negative hostile attitudes that we see towards this group. In some of the more recent work, we've tried to look at how the same media representations affect Muslims themselves. And we are interested in that because a lot of Muslims report experience of discrimination in their daily lives. They also say that they get questioned about their loyalty to their American identity. Um, they're dissatisfied with the representation of Muslims in American media. And they feel as if they can't belong to both of these identities because there's some sort of an inherent conflict perceived between those identities. And that is obviously not true objectively, but those are speculations that we are all aware of um, that can potentially affect the ways that we also identify. And so in a longitudinal study, we looked at Muslim American students and we had a pretty good uh, sample of different uh, ethnic groups being represented. This was three waves that were done during the 2016 US presidential election. And we asked them questions like how often they see negative news coverage of Muslims, um, how strongly they identify with both of their identities as American and as Muslim, and their trust in the US government because American identity or American identification is associated with increased trust in the US government. And what we saw is that negative exposure to negative media representation of Muslims negatively affects how strongly you identify as an American. And that American identification is related to trust in the US government. And so what's happening is that more exposure to negative media representations of Muslims is reducing your trust in the US government via a reduced American identification. And interestingly, this is not happening through Muslim identification. So there's a lot of speculation that it's probably because a lot of these folks are highly identified as Muslim that they don't integrate into their American identities or that they don't trust the US government. That's not true. 
all of these processes are happening through American identification. And so these are social cultural threats that are preventing these folks from successfully identifying as Americans, and those have social political consequences. In a lot of the current longitudinal work, we're looking at how contextual identity threats are changing these identity dynamics for Muslim Americans and other minority groups and are associated with social, psychological, and political outcomes. To give you an example, we're looking at discrimination and exposure to media stereotypes, how they influence the identification and integration of Muslim American identities and subsequently lead to uh, psychological outcomes like psychological and physical health, relations with the majority group, and civic engagement and their interest in voting. I want to quickly just thank all my funders and collaborators, and that's it. Thank you so much. You did so well on time, Muniba. Thank you so much. That was that was amazing. Um, we are going to hold questions until um, the Q and A portion. So I'll go ahead and introduce our next panelist. Is Dr. Bevers here? No, I don't believe Michael is here yet. Okay, so we will come back to him. So um, I think then next we'll go to Samah Jaffer. I believe, I hope I said your name correctly. Salam alaikum. Thank you so much for, for being here with us today. Did I pronounce your name correctly? Yeah, Samah is fine. Samah. Um, so Samah is currently a graduate student um, at uh, NYU and will be getting her doctoral studies this fall at Religious Studies at Yale. Congratulations. Um, she's a dual graduate. She's a graduate of the dual degree master's program in international and world history at Columbia uh, and the LSE. Her interdisciplinary research is focused on the history of Islam and Muslims. Sama is interested in the movement of language and ideas, discourse on Islam and modernity, race and racialization, and Muslim imaginations of justice and temporality. So um, without further ado, Sama, the, the floor is yours. I'll keep time and then um, if, if uh, you run out, I'll, I'll uh, interrupt you, but I think you'll be fine. Great, thank you. Sure. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen. All right, are you able to see the slides? Yep, I can see it. Okay, awesome. All right, well, I just wanted to start off by um, thanking the organizers, uh, Michigan State University Muslim Studies Program for um, putting together this conference and for bringing us all together in these uh, really challenging times um, and for giving me the opportunity to share some of my work today. The title of my presentation, um, Before Creeping Sharia, is a nod to the origins of this project. As an undergraduate student, my interest in the study of Muslims um, and Islam was shaped by the rise in Islamophobia and anti-Muslim racism around the 2015 federal election in Canada and the 2016 presidential election in the United States. Um, and so I came to this project in recognizing that the prominence of, prominence of Sharia as a term and a concept within the popular representation of Islam and in particular, the idea of creeping Sharia or the fear that Muslims are attempting to uproot American democracy and dominate the United States by establishing a foreign and archaic legal system uh, was popularized in the early 2000s. And while the phenomena of creeping Sharia emerged amidst the rise of anti-Muslim rhetoric post 9-11, uh, which is often assumed to be the kind of starting point for contemporary Islamophobia, um, or at least a point of historical rupture, this project pushes back on the assumption that American Islamophobia began with 9-11 and the war on terror um, and by investigating representations of Sharia in 20th century American newspapers. And so in covering Islam, um, Edward Said traces the, political, um, the politicization of Islam in American public discourse in light of global events, uh, applying his theory of the construction of the Orient as the foreign other of the West through the production of knowledge to his contemporary context and analyzing narratives produced in the, by the American media, academy and government, Said argues that um, Islam first became news in, the Ameri in America in the mid 1970s and it entered the consciousness of most Americans principally if not exclusively because it had been connected to newsworthy events like oil, Iran and Afghanistan. And so one of the reasons Said suggests that global events of the later part of the 20th century played a major role in reintroducing Islam to the American public was the disregard for the study of modern or contemporary formations of Islam in the American Academy. Um, the study of Islam was an essentially antiquarian field taken up by scholars who specialized in the classical pre-modern period, whereas the study of modern Islam uh, took place in area studies with a regional focus that was directly implicated by American foreign policy. And so at the same time, he identified an emphasis on the study of Islamic law within Middle East studies. 
And while Said was not necessarily concerned with Sharia, it appears in one of the news sources that he cites. Um, in the rest of his commentary, he kind of defaults to the term Islamic law, which is often assumed to be interchangeable um, with Sharia by scholars, journalists, and non-experts alike. Um, and while my project is not really interested in presenting an authoritative definition of what Sharia is, it's important to recognize that it exists as a Romanized Arabic term in the context of American media uh, within the realm of the untranslatable. And that is as defined by Emily Apeter, the realm of those words that are continually retranslated, transferred from language to language, or especially, especially resistant to substitution, mistranslated. And in the opening lines of Sharia theory practice transformations, um, Wal Halak remarks, to write the history of, the, of Sharia is to represent the other. He argues that our distinctly modern conceptions and modern legislation of language present a fundamental challenge to such representation. So without using the language of untranslatability, Halak foregrounds his study with the issue of assuming Sharia is near, with the issue that assuming Sharia is merely Islamic law. Um, and he suggests that Islamic legal studies and Islamic legal history are in fact Western colonial constructs. And so this project similarly begins to think of the Romanized term uh, Sharia as it exists as an untranslatable in the English language and in American newspapers as having its own kind of distinct history. And in this case being constructed in the purview of American imperialism. And so reading Sharia in the in 20th century American newspapers um, presents a narrative of politicization and historicization, the materialization of anxieties and fears, as well as a genuine attempt at understanding Islam that is not linear yet significantly informed by the events that are being reported throughout the various decades. Um, so the narrative is nonlinear in the sense that the shift in definition that I identify over the decades um, from Sharia as the court to Sharia as the story doesn't occur in a singular progression. Um, and while the articles I read were published for an American audience, the discourse is not merely a one way representation of Islam. Several sources cite expert opinions, Muslims within and outside of America. Um, and there were a few fascinating debates between readers in the letters to the editor as well. Um, and for this project, I reviewed approximately like 600 unique newspaper articles. Um, some from the high, most of them were from the highest circulating dailies, such as the New York Times, Washington Post, um, the LA Times, and the Wall Street Journal. And some of these articles were written by staff journalists, um, while a significant number were reprints from major international news agencies, including Reuters, United Press International, and the Associated Press. And so the shift that I identify mainly occurs in the post-World War II period. However, this does not mean that the term Sharia did not appear in any earlier accounts. Um, in fact, one of the examples that I came across was a series of reports in the New York Times in 1925 on the controversy surrounding the Egyptian scholar Ali Abdul Razak, um, who is identified as the Qadi of a Sharia court. And although the um, controversy itself had to do with Abdul Razak's views on the need for a separation between uh, Islamic codes and secular legal systems, the term Sharia was not used in the description of his actual views um, or those of his opponents, but within the article, um, within the articles covering the Abdul Razak affair, we see some of the trends begin to emerge, including the representation of a coherent Muslim world as a, some sort of a cohesive entity, as well as the inference of a irreconcilable uh, conflict between Islam and modernity. So reading the instances of Sharia from the post-world post-war period, um, a number of trends and patterns become apparent. Sharia was covered far more frequently as time progressed with numbers increasing from around uh, 20 mentions in the 1960s to over 100 in the 1970s. Uh, and while these numbers may be impacted by overall increases in production of news as well as access to international news agencies, uh, it seems that as Said claimed that the 1970s were a pivotal decade. Um, and around this time, the descriptions of Sharia, which originally read as brief, contextual, and at times synonymous, uh, became increasingly historicized, detailed, and elaborate. And so um, in addition to the content of the definitions of Sharia, there was a, tip, a, a shift in the type of stories in which Sharia was cited. Uh, whereas it began in, as a contextual detail, um, it, Sharia can later be read as a focal point of the news itself. In the later, uh, late 40s and 50s, the dominant reference was to Sharia courts, uh, mostly in fo former Ottoman territories, including Egypt, Palestine, and Saudi Arabia. This period of Sharia as the court mainly saw the term referring to the existence of Sharia courts and legal systems. Um, at this time, definitions of Sharia lacked in both detail and judgment, 
Moreover, at this point, Sharia was not always the actual word Sharia in its untranslatable form, but it was um, interchangeable, interchangeable with other terms such as Mohammedan law or Muslim code. And an example from this period um, is the tabloid style, tabloid style coverage of the divorce proceedings of King Farouk of Egypt um, and his second wife, Queen Nariman, in 1952 and 53. So shortly after the rumors of their separation were confirmed, uh, reports by Reuters began to speak of Nariman's right to child custody and her uh, to initiate a divorce in the context of Mohammedan law or Muslim law. However, once the court date was set, it was clear that it was the Sharia Muslim court that would be the institution to guarantee her rights. And without Muslim law, the proceedings would not, would have been entirely in the king's favor. Um, and moreover, there was significant attention paid to the abolition or survival of Sharia courts from the Ottoman period. And so in 1949, there were several um, citations of the maintenance of Qadis and their courts in Palestine um, cited as an indicator of religious tolerance within the newly established state of Israel. And so Sharia as the story um, represents the later decades in which Sharia was contextualized and elaborated upon in the context of increasing interest in the Muslim world. The function of the untranslatable is that it elicits definition and the shift from Sharia as the court to Sharia as the story observes its movement from a peripheral detail in the news stories to a focus of the stories themselves. As Sharia became newsworthy in the later decades of the 20th century, a series of negotiations of its definition, meaning, and socio-political significance emerged. There was an increase in think pieces which warned of the spread of Sharia alongside the global Islamic revival and a rise in fundamentalism. Yet beyond hostile caricatures, there were a series of uh, debates surrounding Sharia and its place in the world, challenging its relegation to the pre-modern. Um, a line of questioning emerged whether Sharia is strict or flexible. Moreover, there was a greater engagement uh, with those who spoke authoritatively on Sharia, including Muslims from around the world, uh, US-based scholars, as well as those who um, wrote letters to the editor pushing back on how Sharia was being represented. Um, some of these experts included Daniel Pipes, Bernard Lewis, Wilfred Campbell Smith, Joseph Schacht, Fazl Rahman, um, Abdullahi Naim, Hamid Algar and Ismail al faruqi so representing a very broad spectrum from Islamophobic Orientalist to conservative Muslim. Um, and in the 1990s, there was an increase in reference to the in economic implications of Sharia, but by that point, Sharia was not merely a fiscal system as it once was a court, but it carried with it the discursive baggage of the preceding decades. And so while Sharia did not suddenly cease to be affiliated with the court, it took on a central role in stories, including um, the murder of King Faisal of Saudi Arabia, the formation of the Islamic Republic of Iran, um, and the presidency of Jafar Namiri um, of Sudan. And the definition, as the definitions of Sharia began to gain more context, detail, and critique, the role of the nation state became more relevant. Islam and Sharia were rarely uh, referenced without mention of a nation or several whose legal systems drew from Sharia. And so the emphasis of certain states, such as the United States and Egypt, and later Sudan and Libya, uh, was kind of an indicator of contemporary American interests as well. One of the debates that um, appeared in this context uh, was on the nature of the Sharia as strict or flexible. And the legalization of abortion in Kuwait was cited as one of the examples of its flexibility, whereas certain think pieces implied that the application of Sharia in Saudi Arabia and Sudan could be seen as a deterrent um, of, to crime more generally. And there was also this fascination uh, with hudud or the uh, fixed punishments for six actions considered to be crimes against God, which were repeated as um, indicators of a, of a state's kind of proximity to modernity. Um, sorry, how am I on time? Okay, we're good. <laughs> just wanted to check. So yeah, while nearly a third of the coverage of Sharia um, between the 1960s and 70s made reference to some element of the sensationalized hudud, there was also an instance where um, hudud pub punishments not being applied in Saudi Arabia was characterized by uh, Thomas Brady of the New York Times as creeping modernism. Um, and this is just one example of some of the more detailed definitions that came out around it or towards the end of the uh, 70s. Um, and one of the main tropes repeated over the decades was the emphasis on Sharia as an archaic legal code from the seventh century, which appeared alongside references to desert tribes. Um, however, such descriptions were not merely referring to Sharia as a legal system. 
or institution that existed in a vacuum, but they were always linked back to a notion of a singular Islamic tradition. Um, and these examples indicate the function of Sharia as a metonym for Islam within uh, American news discourse. At the same time, there's plenty of evidence that Muslims also thought of Sharia in historical terms and continue to do so, yet perhaps not in the same uh, sort of teleology that demarcates Islam and modernity. Um, so one example of this was from a report on the second annual Arab Petroleum Congress in 1960, which cited a debate between two officials on the permissibility of changing a contract. Um, while H.M. Khalidi uh, cited a religion as a reason to honor a contract, um, a lawyer by the name of uh, Sami Shama uh, cited an interpretation of Sharia based on the historical practice of the second Caliph Omar. Um, and amending that, um, citing that amending contracts was permissible when it was in the interest of the nation. So I thought that was just a really interesting um, example. Um, and so a question that underlies this project is of all the Arabic terms associated with Islam, why is it that the untranslatable Sharia is discursively held onto throughout the decades? Perhaps it has to do with the notion that the rule of law is the foundation of Western civilization or with America's interest in maintaining its position as the arbiter of global law and order. Yet considering its fellow untranslatable jihad, perhaps it's, an it's the ability of Sharia to affirm preconceived notions regarding the ontology of the foreign other perpetuated by fear and anti-Muslim racism that makes it so persistent. Thank you. Thank you, Sama. You were perfect, like literally 14 minutes and, and 40 seconds. So that's <laughs> very impressive. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. Okay, so now we get a chance to introduce uh, Martha. I mean, if, say Panigal, is that correct? Panigal, yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much uh, for joining us in this conference. Martha is a PhD student in sociology at the University of Genoa in Italy. Genoa happens to be one of my favorite cities ever, so that is so cool that you get to live there. Um, she works under the supervision of Federico Rojola and Renata Pepicelli. Her main interests lie in post-colonial and gender studies with a focus on gendered orientalism, Islamophobia and racism. We are so delighted that you are here with us. Thank you for uh, staying up into the evening uh, and, and presenting your work. And so without further ado, please go ahead. Okay, hi, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, it is uh, really a pleasure to be here, uh, even uh, if uh, only online. And um, I really want to thank you, the organizers and uh, all the uh, other panelists uh, for uh, the wonderful job and the inspirational works that uh, have been presented. Uh, today, I will present you a part of my PhD research. Uh, it is uh, still uh, an ongoing project, so questions and uh, comments are really appreciated. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, I cannot go. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, so, in this presentation, we'll try to investigate gender Islamophobia in Italy through the analysis of a significant case study, the aid campaign that affected Silvia Romano, a 24-year-old Italian aid worker, uh, which was kidnapped in Kenya by a terrorist group Al-Shabaab, um, which had voluntarily converted to Islam and changed her name to Aisha. Um, Silvia Romano had gone to Kenya to volunteer with an Italian charity group uh, when she was kidnapped by a terrorist group on November 2018. Released after 18 months of detention in Somalia, she landed in Rome on May 2012, 2020, sorry, <laughs> wearing a light green jilbab. In a very difficult time for Italy, which was uh, struggling with the outbreak of the COVID pandemic, her release spread joy and hope. But immediately, joy was succeeded by very violent Islamophobic and misog misogynist insults, especially by right-wing parties and newspaper. At the same time, she has been attacked also by some feminists, influential left-wing journalists and opinion leaders. In this paper, I would like to carry out a discourse analysis uh, on the debate about the kidnapping and release of Silvia Romano, focusing on the way in which contemporary discourses on Muslim and Islam in Italy are produced and reproduced through the recurrence of new colonial strategies. Uh, I didn't wrote it in the, the slide, but I, um, uh, I read uh, more than uh, 100 articles, more or less. 
uh, in my analysis, I will adopt a feminist and postcolonial perspective aware of carrying out a partial and situated standpoint. The essay will be structured into three parts, uh, the, the one you see in the slide. To start with, uh, let me present some theoretical concept to introduce uh, the notion um, that I'm uh, proposing here today. To understand gender Islamophobia, we have to go back to Orientalism and particularly to the concept of gendered Orientalism. Indeed, Orientalism has been described as a strongly gendered system of power in which racialized other is also constructed through gender norms. On the one hand, the myth of the harem and the hypersexualization of the veiled women. On the other hand, the non virility, the feminization, and the homosexual practices uh, uh, attributed to colonized men. These narratives have changed almost reversed over, the, over time in the image of the veiled Muslim women as poor victims to be saved, or in the construction of the Muslim men as a violent terrorist. To actualize the concept, in fact, we can refer to what happened after 9-11, the US invasion of Afghanistan justified, among other things, with the desire to save Afghan women from the burqa imposed to them by the Taliban. I think everybody here already know the, the pivotal work of uh, Leila Buluhud. Um, which spoke about that. Uh, this brings us to the second concept I want to introduce, namely neo-Orientalism. The Orientalist discourse, in fact, persists today in the relationship of the West with is other. Indeed, after the disintegration of the opposite blocs and after 9-11, Islam has become the great Western other, reactivating Orientalist narratives in public and political discourse. Islamophobia thus imposes itself as the paradigm of the so-called clash of civilization, producing a monolithic and essentialist uh, view of Islam. However, as stated by the decolonial theorist Ramon Gosfoguel, Islamophobia is not a new form of uh, racism, racism, as it is often described, as we heard all, also before in the conversation with uh, Professor Kelly de Bayoun. Uh, but uh, instead, it is uh, at the base of the modern construction of the other, even in epistemic terms. To understand gender Islamophobia in the specific case uh, that I will discuss today, let me quote an Italian well-known feminist who expressed on that topic, Lea Melandri, who claim, no one would give a man this vile treatment, the clothes, the religion, the pregnancy, the body. Women have always been judged for this aspect of their private life, end of the quote. In fact, other commentators have noted how the controversies following the kidnapping of Italian citizens have reached these levels of hatred only when the kidnappers were women. Silvia is not only a woman, but she is a converted woman. Her veil is unacceptable and unmissable in the order of the nation, for which white women are essentially considered to be the reproducers of the white nation, as the historian of Italian colonialism, Gabriele Proglio, states in the quote you see there. Silvia, by converting, lost her white privilege, betrayed race and nation, and for all that reason, she has been attacked from various parts of the political spectrum. My second point will focus more deeply in the case presented today, starting with claiming that right-wing conservatives newspaper have violently attacked Silvia Aisha Romano right after her arrival to Italy. Here in the slide, you can see the two front pages of the most popular Italian right-wing newspaper, Libero and Il Giornale. The first one titled, Silvia Romano, I have converted, we freed an Islamic woman. The second one, slap in the face to Italy, Islamic and happy, Silvia the ungrateful. In both cases, it is important to highlight the use of the adjective Islamic, not Muslim, used as a noun. This is a widespread practice, which is important not to consider only a linguistic fancy. In fact, the use of the term Islamic refers in a common Italian sense to Islamic fundamentalism Islamic terrorism. In this sense, it is also interesting to observe the comments of other right-wing journalists and politicians. In a speech due, uh, to the Chamber of Deputies, right-wing congressman Alessandro Pagano calls Romano a neo-terrorist since she converted during her kidnapping by Al-Shabaab. A similar comment comes from the ex-congressman and opinionist Vittorio Sgarbi, according to which Silvia should be arrested for outside participation in a terrorist association. Moreover, the editor-in-chief of Il Giornale, 
male Alessandro Sallusti in a tweet compared her conversion to a Jew coming back from a concentration camp dressed like a Nazi. These individuals, these individuals place Silvia, I quote, in the camp of the enemies of the Italian state, considering her and all Muslim believers, Italian and not, not only as the racialized other, but at the same level as the terrorists, end of the, of, end of the quote. Referring to the usual neo-orientalist trope, according to which Islam equal terrorism. Here, I would like to make a reflection that for me is central to, the anal to analyze and understand the phenomenon of Islamophobia. Very often, the literature uh, on that subject refers to attack on Muslim people referring to aid speech. I find this reading problematic for several reasons, including the following. It trivialized the issue of racialization of Muslim people, relocating these attacks to a generic form of hatred campaign. Secondly, hate speech is not translated in the Italian debate, as well as the term social media, passing the idea that this is a phenomenon confined to the virtual space, to the keyboard warriors, at least those behind the screen and the keyboards were not us. And um, if uh, that hatred did not have a structural dimension if did not have an impact on daily lives of people. Finally, even if uh, it is true that many of the harshest insults uh, came from the right-wing spectrum, the discourse of neocolonial imaginary, veiled paternalism and explicit, explicit racism is uh, um, found also in the left-wing journal. How do we, do we explain this? Are these aspects really disconnected one from another? I will try to answer to those questions in my last point. Uh, so here it is, <laughs> my last point. Uh, in the context of the general sh shift uh, to the right in Italian and uh, European politics, uh, there has also been a noticeable backlash from the liberal left. In this sense, uh, the rhetoric that a part of Italian left uh, has spent to describe civil cultural archive that acts as an implicit substratum. Here in the slide, I show you one of the many articles published in the liberal left-wing newspaper, La Repubblica. As you can see, the title states, the story of Silvia betrayed in the village she wanted to save. I choose this picture because it is revelatory of a general neo-orientalist and white savior attitude present in the articles and comments from what the liberal left Italian context. Uh, indeed, there are numer numerous metaf metaphors on the rescue narrative about international cooperation in the, I quote, remote villages in the heart of the forest, end of the quote. Meta metaphors of the, I quote, terrible condition of Kenyan children, end of the quote, who just need someone to play with and smile to. Italian colonialism in Somalia and in the Horn of Africa, which has caused so many of today's problems in those areas, is completely removed or maybe worse. It is mentioned with a certain nostalgia for the colonies. Another problem that emerged from reading these articles is the neo-orientalist obsession with the veil, combined with the general incompetence uh, about Islam. Here is an example of the description of Sylvia's body. I quote, she wears a green hijab, the color of Islam, rather white over another dress with strong colors, typical of the local tradition. The coverage is not complete. The face is framed by the veil, but, is it, but it is shown. The impression is that of a woman wrapped in a trauma, protected by a mystery who is trying to come to terms with the recent past in order to move forward." End of the quote. Now, perhaps I don't need to emphasize here the difference between the types of Islamic veils, which in addiction to having a religious connotation are influenced by traditional cultural aspects, class and fashion, which also exist in the global south, as the Italian Somali writer Ijab Ashego reminded to us. But really, this green, uh, this green jibab has been called various things, all of them wrong, hijab, burqa, shador, dirac, and Ibaya instead of Abaya. 
Finally, starting from a post on Facebook by the well-known feminist Nadia Riva that you can see here on the left in the slide, a debate started among part of the Italian feminist movement. Nadia Riva has argued that literally, I quote, the poignancy of a smiling woman wearing a green trash bag opening the door to a whole series of other ugly problematic comments, like the one you can see to the right. Interviewed by the newspaper La Repubblica, the feminist claimed that hers was not an insult against Silvia Romano, but a provocation for how, I quote, for a lifetime men have been trying to erase women bodies, end of the quote. This intervention and others that for reason of time I cannot show here is the excellent example of those civilizing form of feminism according to which women's choices are free only if they correspond to the Western secular ideal of liberation. To conclude, I want to introduce some observation about the examined points. As the Italian sociologist Anna Simone noted, the truth is that even traditional journalism has become gossip and therefore uses the same categories of social media to follow trends. In this perspective, I think a broader analysis of the relationship between newspaper and social media in contemporary times is needed. A reflection that is very important for the news world, which in this case, in the case of Silvia Romano, has behaved like the, most, uh, the, like the worst tabloid paparazzi, checking Silvia's Facebook page on a daily basis and lurking under her house to track her every little move. The same ANSA, the most important Italian news agency, has publicly apologized for having given the news of Silvia's first first exit from home after her release, accompanied by the information that she was going to the beautician. Here, uh, there is a partial uh, bibliography I used for uh, this uh, presentation. And um, my very last point is that I want to point out that uh, as this text is a, more, is a small part of the research work uh, uh, I am carrying out for my doctoral thesis, I have concentrated here only on the analysis of discourse as a site of construction and reproduction of power and domination. However, it is important to remember that we are not only talking about stereotypes, or discrimination, but also about the performative and material effects that such discourses produce, from the criminalization of migration to the denial of documents, from social mar marginalization to institutional violence, from exclusion from the world of work to the systematic employment of migrant women in the care sector. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Martha. That was so powerful. I just really uh, commend you such an amazing project for, for really talking about the larger concepts. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. That. You were also one time. <laughs> 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 Remarkable. Everyone. So, I don't think that um, we have our fourth panelist here. Um, so I know that Mohamed has tried to, to reach out. And so um, I think we're just gonna go ahead and, and open it up to um, Q&A for, for the three presenters. I just wanna say that it ended up being a, a all woman panel and that's that's awesome. So, uh, you know, really in, the, in light of um, your point, Martha, <laughs> you know, really uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful. So I think um, what I'll do is I'll first invite the panelists if you have any questions for each other to pose them. And then um, for all of the attendees, uh, if you have any questions to put them in the Q&A and then um, Mohammed and I can also compliment questions at the very end, but we wanna give everybody a chance to, to pose their, their questions. <laughs> I'm happy to, to, to kick us off um, if folks would like. Um, so I will, I had questions for all three of you. So um, I'll, I'll pose them. Um, oh, actually, Brian has a question. Brian, will you, can you unmute yourself? Yes, I think I can. All right. Um, thank you to the three of you for, for your, your um, really wonderful talks. Um, so my, my, I've, I've, um, have questions probably for everyone, but but I'll, I'll focus my question on on um, Sama. Um, I really enjoyed your your presentation. 
Um, and I think in, in some ways it'll, it will resonate a little bit with what I'm gonna talk about um, tomorrow um, because I will also be, be focusing on um, media representations before um, the, you know, before, before the, the alleged turning point of, of September 11th. Um, so, so my question is about um, absences. Um, so my, my question is about instances where you might expect this, this rhetoric of, of, of Sharia to be used, but it isn't used. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm curious if you can talk about um, instances where um, the, this, this sort of multiple characterizability um, of, of Muslims in um, a pre-2001 world, um, in what situations are, um, in what situations is, is, is the term Sharia just not, not used? And what can we, what we, can we conclude from those, those silences, from those, those absences? Yeah, absolutely. That's a really um, great question. And thank you uh, for asking. I think um, in, in my kind of analysis of the various sources, I saw um, a lot of the, the absences or the kind of interchangeable use of Sharia with Islamic law or Mohammedan law or Muslim code and, and other kind of um, renditions in the, in the earlier period, which, which I kind of have dubbed uh, Sharia as the court, um, in, the, in the kind of context of discussing just the, the more so mundane references to existing legal systems. Um, and I think that that, um, because of the kind of methods that I use, a lot of kind of keyword searches and, and, and looking for different, um, uh, also like the way that Sharia was being spelt or um, an interesting kind of uh, thing that I heard was I, I ended up pulling up a lot of um, sources that were just referring to streets, street names in, in Cairo and in the Gulf that were like Sharia or something. Um, so, but I, um, but I think the absence that you're talking about is really important because it, it for me, um, in, in the example I mentioned of the, the divorce of, of King Farouk in particular, Sharia wasn't there all the time. Like there were several um, uh, reports that were talking about the way that, okay, the, the Muslim code will guarantee something for, for his wife in this divorce, but it wasn't, there wasn't kind of this, um, the same emphasis on the term that we do see in the later, um, in the later decades. And along with that, there wasn't that emphasis to define that term in that context. It was just like in parentheses, Islamic law or Muslim code. And it was just kind of there as a, as a detail, but not necessarily um, as something that was elaborated upon. And so I think that that, um, seeing that shift over the decades um, really does say something in terms of how this term becomes politicized and becomes an important part of the discourse. Thank you, Simone. Um, so I had a question for Muneba, um, and it was really about that effect that you, um, or lack of an effect that you reported between reliance on direct contact and um, any effect on the aggressiveness of Muslims or perceptions of aggressiveness towards Muslims. So you didn't see an effect, an effect there. But I'm wondering, like, do you think that you're just underpowered? It was such a small sample size. And I'm wondering about the direction of the coefficient. I mean, that's a bit like technical, but I, I would expect an effect. I was wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah, that's a great point. So yes, we were likely underpowered and um, the direction is as you would expect, where the more contact you had with Muslims, the less likely you were to think of them as aggressive and the less angry you were towards them. But we just didn't find it to be significant, probably because it was underpowered. Um, so I think that if we were to do this with a bigger sample or maybe in an experimental design, uh, we might have enough or strong of an effect that we could find that, that to be significant. But the directionality is as you would expect. Okay. I had a follow-up question about what is a neutral story about Muslims? I, I oftentimes am asked to have some sort of control in my, my studies as well. And I, you know, it's, I, I don't know. So um, I, that's a good question. And I think what happens is that, um, you know, based on the way that we've seen the literature talk about valence, positive and negative. So I always think about positive as something that is obviously uh, something that's gonna make you feel good towards the group, right? So if they're doing like charity work, it's kind of hard to be thinking like, oh, that's a bad thing. Like that's a pretty good thing for most people. Um, if they're doing some sort of a violent crime, that's a negative valence for most people because most people consider violence to be negative. I think that neutral is something that is not obviously positive or negative. So the one that we ended up using was just a news clip in which they were talking about moving the um, football practice time in one of the Dearborn schools to after 
um, you know, uh, sunset to, to accommodate the players who were fasting. So in this case, it's not necessarily positive or negative. It's just kind of like a matter of fact, like, okay, this school decided yeah. to do this. Um, I wouldn't say that somebody would be like, oh, that's obviously positive or obviously negative. So I think something in the middle is kind of what we're looking for in these kinds of experimental manipulations where we don't want to have them do be positive or negative. Yeah, that's helpful. I, um, I was thinking like, oh, the, this Muslim guy ordered Domino's pizza or something. <laughs> like that's a neutral. Yeah, <laughs> and that would work. I, you know, I've heard comedians talk about how they just want just that. They just want to show a guy baking a cookie. Like that should be a new story for, why can't it be a new story for a Muslim person when they're making a cookie, right? And yeah. it can be. And so, yeah, stories like that. Right. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and it's it's also like really great to hear that, you know, um, at least directionality wise, um, having contact might, you know, at least hypothesis wise, like, might actually reduce um, reduce perceptions of aggressiveness. So that's, that's really helpful. Um, I'm gonna continue and ask uh, Sama a question. So I was really interested in your method. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, what the time period was exactly that you were looking at, how you searched for um, articles, you know, what your strategy was for, for classifying them, you know, did you use machine learning? Did you hand classify them? And how did you think of, I mean, it, you did talk a lot in your, um, to, to some extent about, about like that you had multiple ways of, of, um, categorizing that you weren't just looking for Sharia, you were looking like Muslim code and whatnot. So if you could talk a little bit about just the methodology behind it, I think that would be really interesting to learn about. Sure. Yeah. So I think, um, one of the things that I, um, and and I think uh, what I mentioned about like looking at Muslim code and things was not the main focus. Like really, I was really focused particularly on the term Sharia and when does it, when does it appear? When does it get defined and when is it not defined? And so um, I was mainly using uh, digital newspaper archives. Um, and what I did was like a, a variety of keyword searches in the various kind of transliterated versions of the term with, with the, um, you know, diacritics and without. Um, and uh, just um, from there, it, it was kind of, you, um, I, I started to put everything into a massive uh, Excel spreadsheet. Um, and through that would kind of just select the definition itself. And so initially I was really interested in definitions. Um, and what came out to be was it wasn't always a definition that was you know, clear cut as this is Sharia, but sometimes it was just you know, mentioned in passing. It was, there was a parentheses that said Islamic law or Muslim code. I just kind of put all of those by um, in chronology into a into a, an Excel spreadsheet and um, kind of trace the the patterns that way uh, manually. <laughs> um, I think a lot it, of work. I, I have, <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of so I still have this like massive archive on my <laughs> computer and um, I would love to kind of revisit it and and perhaps like use because I'm just not familiar with a lot of like digital humanities methods, but I think it's something that I would be really interested to to um, to pursue in the future because there were a lot of things that like I'm sure I missed just just reading it myself. So yeah. It would be interesting to continue like temporally, you know, to um, the 90s, the 2000s, the 2010s, and then until today, you know, just see the evolution Mm -hmm. but yeah, just really appreciate it. Thank you so much for, for expanding on that. Oh, no. um, and then uh, Martha, I had a question for you as well. Um, so as, as you were talking, I was, I was wondering, you know, like I said, I just, I really loved how you ended your talk about what are the consequences um, of, of this sort of gender Islamophobia that we're, we're observing. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about whiteness um, and how much of what you observed in your research is rooted in, in like a racial hierarchy and sustaining a racial hierarchy? Um, I would have, you know, it would have been interesting to see if there was somebody, you know, and what would the counterfactual look like if there was somebody who was a non-white Italian who had been in a similar circumstance, you know, what, what might we expect? Would, the, would outcomes have been different? You know, I, I was just, I was curious about that. And I, maybe that's not the right question to ask, but that's kind of what was going on in my mind. No, thank you. It's a really interesting question. And um, 
Yes, maybe I didn't develop uh, too much the, the theme of whiteness, but I think it's a pivotal point because uh, I, I started my PhD uh, with this idea of, uh, uh, of studying uh, Islamophobia in Italy because, in fact, I, for my master's degree, I study the um, question of the veil in France and uh, the, the question of the, uh, the, the, the story of the various law and their post-colonial implication. And, um, and one of the, uh, the, the women I interviewed in, uh, in France was a um, converted uh, white French uh, woman. And, uh, and in fact, uh, she, she told me about the, the thing that was kind of uh, uh, yes, losing her privilege of being white because uh, wearing a veil, she was uh, immediately, uh, you know, reconducted to be uh, a stranger, a migrant. And so um, when I, I have to choose to, um, um, the people to interview here in Italy, um, I decide to interview also uh, converted people that um, maybe are not so much in Italy right now, but uh, they are like increasing, especially between women. And, um, and yes, the thing that, um, I mean, that. In a way, Islam is uh, racialized um, uh, all over the world, but in Italy, especially because uh, we have a lot of migration coming from the, the global south through the Mediterranean and through the, the south of Italy. And uh, this uh, threat of the uh, Islamic uh, invasion uh, is very um, often uh, yes, widespread in the, in the media and in the political discourse. So Islam is really associated with migration and the fact that this color line who, which is, I mean, uh, which exists in the, in the nation, in the order of the nation, but which is constantly removed. It's very interesting to see how, uh, for example, um, yes, how the, the color line, I mean, that everybody here think of, about blackness uh, is also uh, present in, um, in the discourse about Muslim people. And this thing to be a traitor of the race, a traitor of the nation, I think it was uh, extremely interesting in uh, the Silvia Romano case, because for example, I'm studying ver uh, various uh, case study. And uh, yes, you know, the, the, the result always this kind of representation of the poor Muslim women veiled. Uh, she cannot decide uh, upon her body and so on. But the fact that she was free, she was born Italian, and then she decided to, to convert is like unconceivable for a, a right wing and left wing commentator um, at, uh, at the same time. I, I don't know if I answer that to your question, but thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Ms. Mohammed? Yeah, first of all, I want to thank uh, the three panelists for a very interesting uh, panel. All three presentations were really interesting. And uh, I actually have a question for each uh, panelist, if you don't mind. Um, so first uh, for Marta, um, you know, Samah spoke about this idea of creeping Sharia you know, that Muslims are trying to infiltrate and take over and have Sharia uh, established. And I was wondering if you could maybe comment on the extent to which that exists in an Italian context. Okay, should I answer or? Okay, okay. Um, but do you mean exactly about the, the, the term Sharia or in yes. general? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I, in fact, I really appreciate Sama's uh, uh, presentation and uh, the untranslatable <laughs> term, uh, because I think that is something that is really present. In fact, when I, it helped me to um, um, uh, have classes uh, with the uh, undergraduate student, uh, I always uh, uh, spend a moment uh, to to let them uh, understand what is Sharia, what is uh, uh, Jihad, uh, for example, uh, and uh, looking uh, at the roots of the term, uh, looking at the um, Arabic uh, meaning of the of the term, because we are so used uh, to that term uh, being used uh, only in that, um, yes, clash of civilization uh, uh, imaginary that we are even not uh, interrogate what they uh, what the 
the meaning of this word are and uh, and that's really strange because as sama uh, um, argue uh, we never found a translation of the term and i mean why a uh, undergraduate student on sociology on uh, um, um, international politics on history wouldn't uh, wonder <laughs> what that means and so yes i think that is a really um really a point and uh, but i think uh, in a in my uh, discourse analysis, uh, and I'm really looking also at the, the terms that, it, that are used because uh, these are fundamentals that, that are not only words, so, you know, <laughs> after, um, behind the words, there are um, words and uh, words. <laughs> and um, yes, a word can really um, that's um, important meaning. Uh, and I think uh, that, uh, oh my God, I lost my point. <laughs> but yes, uh, I, I want to, um, to claim that. And I have also a, um, a story from a friend of me that uh, uh, wrote uh, with other um, racialized uh, Italian uh, people, a uh, zine. So a DIY book uh, in which she wrote a kind of uh, um, replacement manifesto. Uh, of course, uh, she, she was, uh, it was uh, hyper ironical and so on, but she was uh, um, reposted from a right wing uh, politician who claim, uh, oh, can you see, we are, uh, <laughs> we are saying that they are coming for, to replace us and they really are. Look at what she wrote. And uh, I don't know, our <laughs> we were really um, impressionated because uh, it was uh, clearly ironic, but it's difficult to, to interact to, to with uh, those kind of people. Thank you for the, your question. Yes, very interesting. Thank you for that. Um, now, sticking with the idea of, of creeping Sharia, so Samah, my question to you is, um, I get the impression, and maybe I'm out of the loop, I'm old, I'm, I'm missing out on things, but I get the impression that, that this creeping Sharia discourse is maybe not quite, it, it, that it maybe has died down just a little bit, but I could be wrong, but it's, it, you know, and, and it's surprising that it would maybe die down because you look at all of the Islamophobic rhetoric directed at someone like Ilhan Omar or Rashida Tlaib, you would think maybe now this would you would see a lot more of this creeping Sharia discourse. Um, but I get the impression that maybe it's died down a little bit. Am I am I off the mark? What do you think? No, I think I think you're probably right. And um, I mean, my I started this project a while ago, and so the the kind of ideas have been germinating for some time, but just in kind of more recent conversations with um, some of my, you know, friends and colleagues, um, we were, we were discussing as kind of when, when did the, when were the various like speak, uh, peaks, sorry, in, um, in Islamophobia over the 20, 21st century. And I think it was like around the, the, tw in the 2010s in particular that we saw the early 2010s um, with the, um, the kind of uh, the legislations around um, Sharia courts or, or uh, sorry, banning Sharia courts in various states um, in the United States, as well as um, the kind of uh, the, the, the um, kind of hysterical like Quran burnings and these kinds of protests that happened in that period that are that have kind of changed. And, and so we don't see them as much anymore. But I, I think that um, and so I, I'm not exactly sure why why that is why has Sharia maybe fallen out of um, kind of popularity at this point, um, but just as like an anecdotal kind of story earlier this week I um, met a neighbor in person which is like a weird thing to have happen um, and um, he was he was asking me about like and he was an elderly neighbor and and a professor himself and was asking me like. What are you studying? What are you doing? And so we we began talking a bit, and um, somehow the the conversation got to the point of well, there are these Sharia courts in the U.S., and that's a, a conflict of values, and and what does that mean, and and things like that. And so for someone who's a non-expert in the field at all, but still um, having that kind of vivid memory of this being a point of tension for for Muslims in in the West generally. 
So I think that it's something that even if it's not necessarily in the in the media as as the main kind of uh, you know factor for or for why um, Muslims are unable or um, why Islam is incompatible with with the West or with um, American um, uh, public life, I think it's still something that exists within the the bigger imaginary. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you for that, Samah. And it, it you know has to. It's very easy to forget that just five years ago, I think it was, Newt Gingrich said we should test every Muslim, and if they believe in Sharia, they should be deported. Um, so, Dr. Salim, uh, my question to you. Thank you for that for your presentation. You know, um, you were focusing on news media portrayals, and I would like you for you to comment maybe or, or to discuss entertainment media for a moment. Um, you mentioned neutral portrayals. One thing that was very striking to me was watching the new Spider-Man movies and seeing Mus just Mus a Muslim character who's just a normal human being, just, you know, a classmate. Um, you know, I mean, for I don't know why that was very strange. I wasn't used to seeing that. Um, so I wonder if you could comment on portrayals in media and if you'd like to even go so far as to talk about that new show, The United States of Al, but I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I think entertainment media is really interesting, very different than news media for a lot of the reasons that you just um, specified. I think the research focused in a lot of the media effects based research has focused on news because that's that where a lot of the content was. A lot of the Muslim representations, MENA representations were in news. Um, however, when you take a look at content analyses that are looking at entertainment media portrayals, you still get the same general pattern where there is an overwhelming negative representation, but there is more neutral and positive representations than there are in news. And so I think for that, we do have to give entertainment media some credit. Um, in the media effects literature, we often talk about both being important, the quantity and the quality. The quantity is the frequency in which you're seeing a group being represented, and the quality is like the valence that's attached to it. So whether they're represented positively or negatively or neutral. Right, and so I think that as quantity increases, uh, that's not the whole answer unless we also see diversity in the quality of representations. And so in entertainment media, we're seeing both of those go up. Whereas in news media, we only saw the quantity going up, whereas the quality remained negative for the most part. So in entertainment though, quantity is going up, but so is the quality in terms of those neutral and some more positive representations. The effects-based studies that are done on that are a little bit harder because you have to take a look at the global media stimulus. So like an entire movie, which is obviously really hard to do an experimental study. So what people do is they take glimpses of clips and they try to make assumptions based on those, but that's not the whole story because they're oftentimes contextualized within a larger theme that can get mixed and that can get missed out if you only see a two to three minute clip. So I think those kinds of studies are harder to do effects-based work on but they are growing. And so I think that's a good sign. And hopefully we can see some after effects of that in, you know, in a few years where like you said, it'll just be the norm to see representations of the MENA group, representations of Muslims in entertainment media where they're not really doing anything but they're like background characters or they are a side character or they're doing something positive and they're integral to the, the storyline. Absolutely. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. We have a couple questions in the Q and A, so I'll I'll pose them. Um, so one anonymous attendee says, "Thank you so much for your interesting presentations." And this question is to Martha: um, Is there any record of responses by Aisha that either participate in the gender discourse that took place around her story, either reifying it or rejecting it? Okay, that was uh, thank you. Thank you for the answer. Uh, that was a part of my presentation, but then <laughs> it was too long, so I uh, uh, cut it up. And uh, yes, in fact, there was um, many things that Aisha claim, in fact, uh, first of all, from her Facebook profile that was constantly, I mean, daily uh, checked by newspaper, and then she closed it up. Uh, but it was interesting because at the very beginning, she like uh, uh, remerciate all the, uh, the people who were standing for her during her kidnapping. And uh, like, uh, um, she, she, she claimed something like, um, uh, do not uh, get angry for me. 
even if people are, are talking, uh, you, you don't have to, to get angry to, to protect me or, um, yes, to, to claim my, my story. And, um, and then she said something, uh, yes, like, um, thank you to God, I will, um, but we will go through this, uh, this, um, this moment. And so, the, of course, in the public and media representation, the fact that was uh, uh, highlighted was not uh, her um, calm and her um, asking not to, be, to become angry, but of course was the God part. <laughs> like, oh, can you see she's uh, now always speaking about God? Okay, uh, and then maybe because uh, the, um, the question was uh, mostly on the gender discourse, in fact, uh, she, um, there was a controversial point because uh, she um, made her first interview uh, in, uh, for a, um, a Muslim uh, jo um, journal online, uh, but the uh, there is a very conservative uh, journal uh, which is uh, really uh, against um, gender, um, gender like uh, gender studies. Uh, I don't know if uh, in uh, the US uh, there are there is all this. Uh, uh, big uh, discourse um, that is really Catholic uh, against gender studies in school, in elementary school, and so on. And uh, in fact, and this was my point um, in, the, in the presentation, is that uh, she is was accused by some Muslim women to, to have been instrumentalized from uh, the, uh, this journal online, uh, because in fact uh, she she arrived uh, in Italy. She didn't know uh, anyone in the Muslim community, and the first one who demonstrate the interest to her, like she, I mean, she accepted that they're they're interested, and I I I feel her. I mean, but um, yes, this was a really controversial group, uh, and uh, then uh, they they kind of make her say that uh, uh, it was uh, better to be veiled because uh, mm, uh, if not, uh, she, uh, I, don't, I can't remember exactly the, the, the quote, but that uh, Muslim women who were not veiled, uh, were not got good uh, Muslim, you know, and so a lot of Muslim women who were not veiled uh, were kind of angry <laughs> with that because uh, normally, I mean, even uh, if in Italy there is not a real, uh, um, I don't know, uh, feminine, Islamic feminism uh, movement, uh, there are a lot of, uh, um, of Muslim uh, young girl, girl and uh, women um, veiled or unveiled uh, and they um, support each other normally, <laughs> you know, um, like uh, in, in other parts uh, of the world. And so, yes, she, she, she was not so, so well perceived and this is was interesting to me because uh, you know in the um between the, i don't know the two fire the right wing uh, claiming she's a terrorist uh, the left wing claiming uh, uh, she was the white savior going to africa to save the poor children uh, blah 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 uh, there was i mean silvia and the muslim community and it was completely i mean um left apart and uh, yes that was uh, that was a pity but um also the point for for me and that's what this, that's the reason why also i choose to uh, take off this part instead of another that uh, i choose to um doing my re research on uh, newspaper and uh, in fact i me too i searched them uh, through digital newspaper archive and some articles I collected at the time and in fact the, I mean those expression from Muslim girls and women that were some way not angry but uh, disappointed by uh, by Sylvia's claiming I, I saw them like on my Facebook uh, profile and I, I didn't interview them so I, I didn't feel comfortable to use their voices uh, uh, in a uh, but this was also a pity because they only write them in their profile which okay uh, now social media are so important but it do not go went outside their Facebook bubble so yeah, we still have problem of <laughs> communication or representation. 
Well, that was really wonderful. Um, we have uh, one other question um, posed by our esteemed colleague, uh, Professor Salah Hassan. Um, and this is on gendered Islamophobia, um, but so Martha, I think, you know, definitely please do uh, weigh in on this, but I think maybe this is something that uh, Sama and Muniba, if, if you'd like you, I think your voices would be really great to, to have highlighted as well. Salah writes, on gendered Islamophobia, there is a long history of Western criticisms of Islam based on gender inequities in Muslim cultural social traditions. And conversely, there are Muslim criticisms of Western sexual exploitation of women. Aren't these contending views of women's social status actually convergence of patriarchies in the sense that both position women as a measure of civilizational values? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you uh, for uh, for the question i think yes but in fact i'm uh at the at the moment more um i mean uh, uh more into western representation of um the um, the muslim um, community and for example um i i quoted it uh, maybe in the panel, but uh, in the paper, but I don't know if I put it on the, the slide. Uh, this is uh, this great job uh, by um, the Italian sociologist uh, Sara Farris uh, about femonationalism. And so in the way in which uh, violence against women is instrumentalized for racist, racist pur purpose. <laughs> because for example, in Italy, we have uh, one uh, femicide each three days uh, made by men to their their companion, ex-companion, and uh, uh, wife, ex-wife, and so on. And uh, when um, Italian men kill their uh, their wife, uh, they are always, uh, you know, um, narrated as, uh, oh, it was uh, a moment of craziness, or uh, I don't know, all these uh, uh, stereotyping, uh, you know, idea about uh, the craziness of love and so on. Instead, when a uh, non-white guy a racialized person, a migrant person, uh, men um, uh, do commit uh, violence. Uh, it, it is no more a question of uh, the person who commit violence, but of the culture, of the group, you know? And so, mm, and this is very interesting because uh, Sarafar is really good, well explained that this is used also at the, uh, at the level of European Union uh, or European Union to uh, produce law, to produce, uh, you know, the integration policy. Um, and that's very interesting. But yeah, I think uh, definitely is, uh, it is in the two, in both senses. Uh, I mean, uh, that women are always spoken to and never <laughs> let me sp speak. <laughs> Absolutely. Nice, really okay, well, um, that's all the questions we have. Thank you all for your amazing contributions for sharing space and, and presenting your scholarship. Uh, I, I know that we have all learned a tremendous amount from you and really we, we appreciate you all so very much and thank you for helping us to build community. Thank you. Mohammed, would you like to, I'm um, oh, sorry, go ahead, Sma. <laughs> no, I was just gonna say thank you to the, to the two other panelists, especially for your um, excellent presentations and, and for having us here. Good. I think maybe Dr. Salim, you were gonna say something as well? No, I was just gonna thank you guys for organizing oh. it and for all the, everybody else for presenting it. I learned so much, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, uh, Professor Inesita Lejavardi for moderating this panel and uh, uh, I want to let you all know that tomorrow we have two panels. Uh, we have the first one at 8 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, and then a second one at 9.45 Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, and then at uh, 11.15, we'll have closing remarks by Professor Lejavardi and uh, conversation. So um, we still have a lot, to, uh, many interesting uh, presentations tomorrow. I want to thank our great presenters today. We had a very, I think, a very nice first day and a great conversation with Professor Lejavardi and Professor Khaled Beydoun. Um, and so many thanks to all of you who attended and I uh, look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.